He threw it from out of bounds to the other corner. Victor Wemanyama is a freak, but Nikola Jokic is a monster. Are they going to wind up as a rivalry? Plus, the MVP straw poll is out, and it's looking like MV3. All this and more on Locked on Nuggets. You are Locked on Nuggets, your daily Denver Nuggets podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Nuggets, your daily Denver Nuggets podcast, part of the Locked On Network, your team every day. Thanks for joining us and making us your first listen. Appreciate you guys being with us Monday through Friday and being an everydayer. Checking us out, whether you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on YouTube. You can go to youtube.com slash Locked On Nuggets. Hit the like and subscribe button if you want to join in the live shows that we record. Uh, World's Finest is Sunday nights around not, between 9.30 and 10 Mountain Time, and Wednesdays at around between 9.30 and 10 in the morning. So it's either morning or night. Uh, or you can catch Swipa on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Swipe and Gripe on Friday mornings as well. Glad to have you guys with us here on a Wednesday. Uh, on today's show, we'll talk about the Nuggets win over the San Antonio Spurs. Yoga drops 42 in the win. We'll talk about whether or not Victor Wamanyama and Nikola Jokic will wind up being rivals of any sort of sort or is it more of a different kind of comparison of where they'll be at in their careers plus the mvp straw poll is out and it's good news for Nikola jokic and those that want him to win his third mvp we'll talk about it might that. be bad news for jokic man i don't know we'll find out we'll talk about it i think he's moved i think he's honestly moved past it but we'll yeah. talk about it uh all right let's start with this the nuggets get the win over the san antonio spurs in a surprisingly entertaining contest uh 110 105 let's go through some stat lines here Jokic has 42 points, 16 rebounds, six assists, one steal, and two blocks, like a normal person does. Victor Weminyama has 23 points, 15 rebounds, eight assists, and nine blocks. It's crazy. Uh, Weminyama does shoot uh, nine of 29 from the field. The efficiency was not there. It was there for Jokic as it always is. He goes 18 of 32 from the field just one of six from three point range. Unsurprisingly, he was trying to space out the Spurs in particular. He was, I actually thought he was shooting a lot versus Zach Collins, which I don't necessarily think is like, usually he does that when he's like, let's, let's pull this big a little bit up. Let's just, let's just make him think about it a little bit. Um, I also think he was more like, I don't want to waste my time going to work on Zach Collins. But Well, we, well, honestly, it might be that we always say this, but this time of year, Yoke starts taking more threes because he needs them in the playoffs. That's and accurate. I do wonder if there's a little bit of a, I always say, Shooting is about uh, three point shooting is a lot about confidence to shoot it quickly. Like if you hesitate, you think about it for any second, your percentages are going to go down. So I think there's a mental adjustment that Yoke makes every year where it's like, I got to shoot no hesitation. I'm open. Just take the shot. And so I kind of expect him to take four five, six threes a game for the next five, six games. Do you think he needs to get that up? I think he's so right now. I mean, every year he shoots well in the playoffs, knock on wood, but, but I'm not sure. But my confidence is never high going into the playoffs in his three point shot. So I almost feel like he does need to get that rhythm. That's like among the many of the various things where I'm like, this is probably going to be a harder playoff run, even though I'm like, I still think they're going to win. Um, it's probably going to be harder is because I'm like, he may not shoot 45% from three again. Like that might just change things. Um, this was Malone was irritated after the game and I don't blame him. Um, the, okay. I'll, I'll put it this way. My take and you were there at the arena uh, and Malone asked you where he'd been. Um, <laughs> my take on the post game with Malone was in his head before he, like before he got up on the podium and while he's up there is like, don't get mad. They did this last year. Don't get mad. They did this last year. Don't get mad. They did this last year. That's how it felt to me where he's just like, talk to him all night about transition defense and they didn't defend in transition. I talked to him all day about, all, about I've been talking about how much offensive rebounding we've been giving up and they're still giving up offensive rebounds. Um, I can tell that he's like very much trying not to fall into the trap that he did last year where he was extremely stressed out by their performance that last month of the season. Um, and be like, they're going to be fine. This is a choice that they're making. It's impossible <clears throat> for them to get up for this game. I'm not surprised. Like they got out for that Cavs game. They lost two straight and were, um, yeah, played hard. They, played they well. came out and played amazing in the Cavs game. And then this one was kind of back to like, okay, what do we got to do to win? And this could have gone the other way, but they did enough in the end versus a, a Spurs team that is not equipped to win those types of games to get it done. I honestly think Denver missed shots. I mean, they shot 29% from three. 
Um, and, and there were a lot of really good looks that they got in that first half that you get a couple of those to go down and the game opens up. And yeah. I just felt like they missed all of those in the first half. So some of it is that. But I agree with you about Michael Malone. The, except I phrase it differently. I don't think it's that he's trying to tell himself to calm down. I think he gen, genuinely believes in this team because he saw it. Like we all mm -hmm. worried about the team last year. And I think he's like, oh, okay. Now I know what these guys are feeling. I know what they're capable of. I know how it is. You have to manage. So I'm going to keep preaching my talking points. I'm not going to overlook the fact that they're not rebounding and they're not guarding in transition very well. And he actually, both of those things, by the way, come down to the same flaw. And I thought he articulated this well. He said on defense, when the shot goes up, we're all ball watching. And that gives people yeah. offensive rebounds. On offense, we're ball watching when the shot goes up. And that gives transition baskets. So both of the problems right now come from a lack of urgency in this liminal space of the of between offense and defense, the rebounding portion of it, which you could say, okay, well, that's good because then you just got to focus on that and you'll win in the playoffs. I think my and that's the thing we're saying about is it's hard to say a team will do it when they haven't proven it. But Malone's going off of last year that they can flip that switch. And those little things, those little margins are the difference between bad regular season play and good playoff play. I think coaches are and particularly him because he's talked a lot about how much he hates to lose. I think that to be a great coach, you have to be wired a little bit as a psycho. And I think yeah. part of that it's, well, look, we got to get off to a good start. If we don't get off to a good start, we're chasing the entire year. Oh, we got to we got to keep up this momentum because this is the hard part of the season. This is <laughs> got to close gonna strong. <laughs> got to close strong. You don't want to be not <laughs> playing your best right. basketball going into the playoffs. And it's like, <laughs> OK, <laughs> over 82 games. Guess what? You're probably not going to play well at some so point true. or another. Um and so I, I think for him, it's like he'd rather like and he just doesn't want to because it is on him if they slip and then they come out in the playoffs and they're like and they're still playing like this. It's his fault for not having them ready. Right. It gets his job to kind of be on them. But it's tough when you have a veteran group right, like this. The other thing I will just say is like um, so I think I thought the Spurs played pretty well for them. You look at the splits and you're like, oh, boy, 40, 29. But like I thought that they executed pretty well. They played hard, um, and it, like that was enough to get them into a game where the Nuggets shot badly. Like that's kind of like I, this is a good example, honestly, of the margin for error I'm always talking about. The gap that I'm always referring to is like what happened. Well, the Nuggets shot poorly and did not have a lot of energy, and the Spurs had a lot of energy and played pretty well, and so the result was that the Nuggets only won <laughs> by yeah. a handful. Like right. that's the gap between these two teams. Yeah. Right. If the Nuggets give that kind of a performance, both shooting wise and energy wise, because I will say this, like, I think those two things are actually related in terms of the shooting. They look tired to me. And again, I want to say this again. I, I, I feel confident and I may be wrong, but I feel confident in my ability after doing this for so long to be able to tell the difference between we don't care mm -hmm. and we're just tired. Yeah. I agree. And they look tired yeah. like AG and Reggie in particular, those two guys looked really tired last night. AG's podium game last night was the lowest energy podium I've ever seen from him. That was yeah. and look, he took a tough fall. Maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe I don't know. But yeah. last night he he basically was sleeping at the podium while while talking to us. Uh Ted's up stat lines Respectfully. like this prove Jokic loves to get up for the big games. I don't know that this is like I understand it's like, well, it's Victor uh, Weminyama. I I think that there is two things concurrently. There is a long-standing history in the NBA of when there is a young pup that comes in that is going to be on your block at your position, gotcha. that guys make a statement. It is it. not coincidental that Joel Embiid's 70-point game came against that squad. It is not incidental. Oh, um, really? That was against Wemby? Yeah. Or was Wemby not playing that game? I don't even know. No, he played. because I watched was, Really? Played. You remember that play in the, I think it was the third quarter, where Yoke, like, just, like, ju just like bodied into him and MB, mm -hmm. and Wemby just went flying. There was like five of those versus Embiid. Like Embiid cleared him out with one hand and pushed him like five feet yeah. away. Um, the other thing I think is, is very much literally like this one, honestly, to be really honest with you, this 42 point performance, Yoke is amazing. I don't think I need to like validate my, my belief that Yoke is amazing. Um, but also this one goes in the wizards category for me where I'm like, yeah, he had 42. That, that he was, he, he played 37 minutes versus the Spurs. That tracks.
Yeah. I mean, it's still a good performance, but you are right that these numbers this year are are like this. And when you play bad teams, you're supposed to put up good, you know, good numbers before I want to get to the Jokic part on the other side. So I'm going to push the thing about, you know, a new guy coming in on the block to the other side. But we should mention MPJ tonight gets the game oh, winner yeah. and we don't he doesn't get a lot of opportunities to get the game winner. I mean, he does get some, but I thought this was a really cool one because unlike a lot, Michael Porter gets a lot of nail in the coffin shots. He gets a lot of, all right, you're up four, yeah. there's 30 seconds left, mm -hmm. and now the ball goes to the corner, he hits it, you're up seven, the game's over. He doesn't get a ton of these, and when they happen, they're really special. And last night, he did a lot of – we talk about Murray's out. Is Porter going to start gunning? I thought Porter didn't take any shots that were really like out of the ordinary. He kind of played his game. He got 16 rebounds. Really? So you thought he was gunning? Oh, yeah. Both Blackburn and I were looking at each other in the first quarter like, oh, Mike, Mike Mike's going for it. <laughs> yeah, really? no, I thought he was gunning. Yeah. Well, see, I thought he played well within himself, and then he gets that shot at the end, and he knocks it down. And I just, I'm happy for Mike to get, uh, to get those chances and get those opportunities because they don't come too often. 15 and 16 too. He had 16 rebounds. So it's a big game, man. <laughs> and, and actually, when rebounding is such an important thing, you get 16 from Yoke, 16 from Porter, seven from Aaron Gordon. You know, even Peyton Watson gets six. There's so, a, two, there's two sides of this coin, which I think is really interesting. Which is like. Um, you can say like, oh, MPJ was facing a bad team and saw an opportunity for him to get going. Or uh, the positive way to spin this is actually, hey, the team's kind of low on energy. Everybody else is gassed and Jamal's out. So MPJ picked it up energy. and played hard on both ends. Don't you think, I, I don't think MPJ ever like brings bad energy. I think that's one quality of him is he always, he likes to play. He seems to like to compete mm -hmm. and he doesn't that always dude, play well. That but... dude, that dude never pouts. Yeah, he plays hard. He doesn't sulk. He doesn't lethargically just go through the motions. He plays hard. On the other side, we'll talk about Victor Wabanyama versus Nikola Jokic and whether that will be a rivalry for years to come. And later on, the straw poll indicates that we're going to have MV3. We'll talk about all that and more on the other side on Locked On Nuggets. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into power, speed, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make the, your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. We'll be right back on Locked on Nuggets. Back here on Locked On Nugget. Thanks for joining us and making this part of your day. Appreciate you guys being with us on a Wednesday. World's finest, Adam Mars and Matt Moore. Uh, I will open the floor to you, sir. Your thoughts on Victor Wamanyama versus Nikola Jokic and what the future holds for that matchup. I mean, the future seems really bright for, for San Antonio. I mean, he's a heck of a player. He's really grown over the course of the season. Is the, the, I think the most impressive thing and the reason I'm sold on him is how much he has picked up over the course of one season. And last night, I, I was texting a group of friends this last night. Wemby is one of the guys that I'm really glad I went to see in person. I highly recommend Nuggets fans. That's a game you go and watch. Wear your Nuggets gear. Don't you know we're not doing the Wemby thing. But you go to Denver next year when they come to town. He's a guy that I think you need to see in person. He's on the short list, and he's probably at this very moment number one guy for me that you have to see in person. Part of this is his body is just so unique, and you're never not aware of it. You're, you you never go like a few minutes where you're like, wow, I forgot how big Wimby is. He's enormous. He's he and, and it really stands out. Two and, and obviously he makes incredible plays. The crowd had this fun energy. Remember when Yoke took it to LeBron in the post years back, like in 2017, and what a big moment it was because you kind of felt like, all right, LeBron versus the next guy, and there was this energy. There was that in the building last night. Every time Wimby got Yoke with a block, it was a big like, oh my god. And every time Yoke got Wimby in the post with a jump hook. There was this, yeah, show him, don't you know, show the young pup. So I thought there was a great energy to it. But lastly, the thing about Wemby last night that I loved was watching his mannerisms off the, you know, when the when he was not quote unquote in frame. The guy is really competitive. He's a little edgy, edgier than you would think. And there was just a lot of emotion from him in the moments of the game when he would not have been on television or the camera would not have been following. And I just thought that was really interesting. So not, not everybody has that, and he has a lot of that intensity. Malone singled out his passing pregame. 
he was talking about how good of a playmaker him being a willing passer i think is like a really big part of this you have to have that kind yeah. of instinct i think out of the gate and it's going to do him really well where a lot of guys what will happen is they're dominant one-on-one -on -one situations but when the help starts coming they struggle and when yama has a really good ability uh, not ability he still struggles with it because he's young but i can tell that in a couple of years he's gonna like he'll make those reads he'll he'll anticipate those reads and he'll make them he's got a real confidence he's got a real he doesn't I'll say this. He doesn't drift in games, which I think is really important. A lot of the hyper athletic, super long guys that I've seen will just drift along. They'll have stretches where it's like, oh, that was really good. That was really good. And then like, oh, they, they kind of drifted. Or if you're physical with them, they're kind of like, okay, maybe not. He battles back against that physicality. He loses because he, he's a buck 80, but like he battles he does in, battle. those, yep. in those situations. Uh, he gets not, I will say this, one of the things I like about him, he was calling for fouls on drives and finishes last night, yelling at the official for him. But when he gets knocked down, he doesn't be like, where's my foul call? He just gets back up and runs. Yeah, And that's really important to me. Because yeah. like, that's in, that for a kid. He's 19. That, like that, that is MVP behavior. Um, I'm like someone else in Dallas. So I think if you're like looking at, the future of it, though, I think it's really interesting because you, you've kind of made in, in our sidebar here. You said Jokic is this area is Duncan Wemby's timeline. You know, uh, Duncan was in the second to last year in Yoke's rookie. And so I actually don't well, know if Jokic that, was what? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. OK. So Jokic's rookie season was right, right. Duncan. He was already he was no longer Tim Duncan, the MVP. He was he was already on the downside. Sure. Right. And so I, I'm really trying to think back of an era where we had kind of this comparison of this this timeline crossover where a guy's in his prime and then the young guy is at this point in his career where he's a rookie you can make a borderline kobe of uh in like jordan yeah of oh totally. three oh i was thinking kobe lebron of oh three right like kobe's in his prime no, like championships. kobe played till 2013 that's just way too i guess maybe yeah i guess yeah i guess maybe i mean Yoke won't play that long i don't think but it, yeah. like this, and this is kind of where it's interesting it is a i think it's a very unique situation where yoke is 27 gonna turn 28 and so he's got five more years of prime left right like he'll be good probably till 33 if he chooses to play that long would you think is that too high I mean, who knows? Okay. Uh, do you want to go longer? You can go 35 if you want. Because no, I maybe. mean, yeah, I mean, who knows? I would right. say, I, that's would be my guess, 33 to 36. And then most rookies don't start winning until year, year three. Like they, at, at, uh, the, at, least, earliest. at the yeah. earliest. Yeah. At the it's absolutely. usually like year five, year six, right? Yeah, you usually totally. need to be in an age 26, 27 before you start really winning. Um, it's one of the reasons why I think Yoke is actually an exception because I always kind of think back on that. I'm like, Wow, like his rookie season was 16. They made the playoffs in 19 and the conference finals in 20. Like it took him four years for him to, and now he was older, right, than Victor. And I think that matters. But that timeline crossover, I think, is really interesting just when we look at what they're going to be for one another because Embiid's going to be, or I'm sorry, not Embiid, Wemby's going to be 27 when Joker's 33. And so, like, that's like a really interesting, like, crossover point. Right. of where they're going to be at in their careers. Yeah. No, totally. I, I mean, it is hard to say. I was thinking Dwight and Shaq, but they're, the game is different now in that I feel we look forward more than maybe we did even in 2004 because Shaq was still super dominant in 2004. I know he's going to Miami, mm -hmm. and it was his his down arc was maybe a little steeper than than like a Kobe's was. Kobe yeah. Kobe's 10 years kind of on, on a decline, but what's still great. And maybe that's similar. I don't know which one it is, but – so I think there is something to it. Here's the thing I would say, and I love Yoke because everyone's hyping Wimby. Everyone's hyping him. And Yoke is consistent. Every time he's asked about a great young player, he always says, we'll see. Like the guy has a lot of potential, but Yoke seems so unimpressed with potential, not because he doesn't think it matters, but because I think he knows this core truth of sports, which is that talent is only so much and you have to see the other parts of it. And he said, he's humble. He works hard. Um, I can't remember what the other adjective was that he used, but he, but he basically, and he said, and that's a great combination. So he's like all sign. Jokic was basically saying after the game, all signs point towards this guy's going to be great, but we'll see greatness. You can't always say how it's going to be. And I'm going to say when Binyama, and I think Jokic, and I think a lot of players of this era, 23 points, 15 rebounds, eight assists, nine blocks on a random game in your rookie season as a teenager, there's only 20 players in NBA history capable of putting up that stat line. Yeah. So Wemby has this weird thing 
where his stats are always going to be outliers and spectacular. And he's great. And to get those, you have to have a certain level of greatness. But I think what Yoke knows and why he always answers these things differently is greatness, spectacularness, all these things, they don't equal winning. And we have to wait and see if those things equal winning eventually. That's a really great point that you could use with a lot of people in the MVP conversation. You could have even used it for Jokic last year, though. And th- and I think this is part of Jokic's why Jokic always dampens these things is it's like, yeah, man, these things are impressive and awesome. But there's this other component of yeah. of winning. And I think, and you know, the ultimate example of this to me is Embiid. This is why when he scored 70 points and Kevin Durant said, I said he's the greatest player of all time. And it's like, yeah, man, scoring 70 is hard. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win championships. That just means you're really good at this really difficult thing. But that's not all of it. And I think I evaluate, I evaluate most players based off of um, the core principle that I kind of came to in MVP thought process, which is how much do you impact winning? How much does what you do help your team win? It's not how much you do. You can do a lot. You can do so much, but if it doesn't lead to winning, it doesn't matter. It's just numbers. Like I'm an analytics forward guy, but the big key for Wemby is going to be translating how he can impact the game with his production, with his play and do the things that lead to winning. And that's really, I think is, is the big key element. Um, Speaking of the MVP, the straw pulls out. And oh, real quick, we didn't mention the timeline. Can we just mention the timeline real quick? Yeah. I don't, we don't know what the Spurs are going to do. I actually thought for as good as Wimby was, and he did block Yoke a lot, I thought Yoke still was comfortable in this game. And that's, I know that's weird to say on a guy that had nine blocks and it was a five point win. You can tell when Yoke is struggling with a guy or this or that. And I just didn't think that was the case last night. I no. think there was a little testing the parameter, like, okay, he's good at that. Oh, he blocked me there. I didn't expect that one. But yeah. I don't ever feel like Yoke was like, man, how do I get by this guy? I think he was no. just like, oh, I, I screwed that up. I'll, I'll change it the next time. Jump hook. Yeah. Switch. No, the, the, he's not. Look, I mean, nobody bothers him. I could. I, I, I've watched every offensive, not every. I've watched 75% of all of, uh, Jokic's possessions where he scored either scoring or assisting in the last five days i've done all of those there's just nothing like there's there's nothing you can do um but victor definitely is not i don't think victor's gonna cause problems for him for a long time really no because he's gonna get the weight he's just he's gonna add the weight or or the teammate like there is Uh, the right combo or something in the individual and maybe but that's like in winning the game in the individual matchup victor's just gonna have to add so much weight in order to be able to hang with yoke so he is so big though that he affects as a help side defender man he covers so much ground like the whole game was really the team just kind of being like man he's everywhere he's everywhere and they figured out but yeah i i wrote a column this season for action where one thing i said and and malone mentioned this too um the biggest thing for me about Wemby is just we've never seen anything like it Mm -hmm. we've never seen anything like victor womanyama and that i think is what makes him so exciting uh on the other side we'll talk about the mvp straw poll and we'll get into the chances which are high of nikola Jokic winning his third mvp up that next on Locked on Nuggets. Fire TV is your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well fire tv channels lets you dive into all the game analysis highlights and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports march madness nba mlb and lots more not to mention great news entertainment gaming travel cooking videos as well check out fire tv channels on fire tv and alexa devices if you haven't checked out fire tv channels you should trust me on this to learn more visit amazon.com slash locked on fire tv we'll be right back on locked on nuggets Back here on Locked On Nuggets, thanks for joining us and making this part of your day. Appreciate you guys being with us. ESPN published the latest straw poll from Tim Bontemps, the last and final MVP straw poll, and Nikola Jokic has expanded his lead. If you're joining us on YouTube, you can see the results right there. Jokic with 85 out of 100 first-place votes. Shea Gillis-Alexander is second with 10. I expect that to slip 
before now in the end of the really end of the actual vote. Luka Doncic with one, but he's got 31 second place votes and 43 third place votes. Total points. Jokic is ahead by more than 300 total points. Uh, Shea is currently up about 150 on Luka. I expect that to shrink and for Luka Doncic to finish second. Um, so here's an, I have a question for you. It is totally okay if you're if you are outright like no, that's totally okay. I think it's an interesting question. Um, where would you rank this MVP season amid Jokic's four? Third, third. Me too. Does the fact that he is going to win in a season where he hasn't <laughs> been the best that he can well okay. should it matter? I mean, I think he's the MVP. To me, I think he's the clear MVP. I actually think we do this every year. When a guy is overwhelming favorite at it for, for so long, I think that it we are more likely to poke holes in it almost out of boredom. Like in this year, he was the favorite early on. He was the favorite in the middle. He's been the favorite in the third third. Now he's the favorite here. So I think there's this level of like, all right, are we sure though? Are we sure? We have too much time to second guess it. So I think he's the clear best. Part of this is I think the comp the challengers in 21 and 22 and 23 were better. Giannis was better. Embiid was better. Embiid removed from the conversation this year because of, uh, you know, because of missing the games. So I think that that is part of it. And then to me, just Shea Gildas Alexander, he's a great player. But to me, it's a it's like Tatum's a great player. But there's just a there's a level below you. Woo, you do not like SGA. I you love are SGA. Not impressed with that guy. I love SGA. No, I'm I, how with this how team. can you do this? How can you watch again? Him? I think uh, <laughs> he is he is the most dynamic two way player this season. You're you're gonna vote Shea, huh? This is no, I already voted. Vote. No, I'm not, I don't have a vote. Oh yeah. But in the straw poll, I had Jokic won. Um, I, I look, I think Shea, again, I think he is better than Tatum. I'm saying that there are players that I think are more impactful than, than Shea is. And he is great at the level of impact that he makes. That's crazy to me because the entire argument I have for Shea is Shea is the second most impactful in winning over the course of the season. It's not just like, you, I have a hundred percent usage and throw a bunch of assists all the time to spot up shooters. And flail for, for flail for some fouls. Definitely draws a lot of fouls. Doesn't flail as much. Uh, he impacts the game on the defensive end. He's a transition player. He, he's the core. He's, he's the core engine of a lot of these teams. Unlike like he's the core engine of the Thunder. Unlike Giannis, and his his play, you you have to say it's impacted winning. They've won. Like they win by more when he's on the court, and they've won more games. And like. That's a thing that's happened. That's the season that's occurred. Now, I came to the point of Shea dropped off. And Yoke didn't, I don't know, like he surged some and and not surged, right? Here's what's really funny is Shea is the new Jokic, man. Shea is the guy that has done all of the stuff to help win. And everyone's always like, it can't be him. What about this other guy? What about, what about this guy? Did you see that? He had 70 versus the Atlanta Hawks. Can you believe it? And so you, like, I think you just hate you. I think think you think you hate Luca, man. Oh, I uh, think I, you hate SGA. I love SGA. No, I'm a big fan you're of You're very his. annoyed that the Thunder are still at the top of the Western Conference versus the Nuggets. I'm That's I the honestly am not, Matt. I honestly am not. I like this Thunder team. I mean, here's the thing. There are there's almost like a split in the NBA right now in how teams build. On one half, you have very like individualistic play. I would say this to me, the Suns are the ultimate expression of this. They are a bunch of guys that just want to cook and they want proper spacing around them. And then there are teams that like really have a camaraderie and a connectedness. And the Thunder are to me are one of those teams. And I like those teams. So all the teams that sort of have that, that sort of fight for each other mentality and, and harmony and how they play. I like, and the Thunder are like one of the best examples of that. So I don't have any problems with the Thunder. I, I more just think that I've said this before. Jalen Williams to me, major impact piece. He's a big reason of why they're as good as they are. They've had remarkable health. So, like to me, when I look at that, I go, Shea's really good. The, the Celtics are really good. The Celtics, you were talking about winning. The Celtics are winning, but we all kind of know, like, yeah, Tatum is a part of that, but not as big of a part of that as other players. That's just how I feel uh about Shea at this very moment. Can you guys something somebody you posted the comment that they're trying to steal Jokic's MVP? How can that be true when he led in the straw poll three different times? Well, these the straw poll is not. Here's what's interesting about the straw poll. It has been incredibly influential on the MVP. I really believe this. 
Like it's really influential in the markets. After this came out, in fact, I should have looked before on FanDuel and seen what were the odds before today and after today because I would bet they shift because of how influential it is. But I kind of think this one will be less influential in part because I think the conversation is less toxic than it was last year. So I wonder if it'll be less influential. And the people that are interviewed for the straw poll are not like I, you and me both are interviewed mm -hmm. for this. We're not voters. So it's it sort of mirrors what we expect voting to be, but it's not a perfect copy. And yeah. I think this year it'll be less of a copy than ever before. I disagree because there are a number of voters that are included in the in the straw poll. There are a, a high number of them. Um, the other votes are the votes like the TV people, those types of folks, the more hot take artists. Luke is oh. going to gain. Luke is going to gain a lot of ground with those folks. Can they I show will, you something that you might enjoy here, Matt? Sure. Five people have never voted Jokic first in MVP. Never, not once. Greg Anthony, Rick Buecher, Dave McMenamin, Dwayne Rankin, Ramona Shelburne. Yoke's been in the MVP conversation for three straight years. He's won two. He lost one. Five. It's crazy to me that there are people that not once in any of the three years voted Jokic. To me, that's insane. I get one year, maybe two you felt the other way, but to go all three years and never once felt him, I, I go, hmm. I think the problem I have with that is if you're analyzing it year by year and your standards are different from those of us that are on the more analyst side of things, I think it's I think it's possible for you to have that. Now, does it say that you probably underrate Jokic? Yeah. Like it just does. Like it just underrates it. Because I would actually say, um, we were talking about this last night, there are narrative voters that vote based off of like, what's the story of the season? I actually think Jokic has very much been one of the stories of the season. Like this has been the year when he has finally gotten the validation that Nuggets fans have wanted for years. He is regarded as like, I'm writing his argument right now. I'm writing the argument on like, what's the, um, like what, what's the, what's the argument in a nutshell. Right. And the argument for Jokic in a nutshell is best in the world. That's the argument is he's the best in the world. Oh, I, I, and I would say that he, whether he touches the ball, doesn't shoots, doesn't whatever he impacts every single possession in ways yep. no other player does. Yep. I mean, on the offensive end, on the offensive end. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's another side. I don't know if you remember that, but like, um, there's, I think you don't know if I remember that there's a defensive side, Matt, I'm just ribbing you. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so I, I think that it's interesting from the perspective of, I, I do think it's going to mirror, I think it's going to mirror the straw poll, except that I do think Luca overtakes Shea. So I guess I don't necessarily disagree with your take because I do think Luca is going to overtake Shea. I think that most of the people that are, that, that were polled in this are people that watch the league like closely from November all the way through and aren't just like, well, yeah, you know, in March, he's been really good. I've been watching these games since the tournament. He's been really good. And so, like, I think that those... Let folks... me ask you this about winning, though. Let me ask you this about winning. Shea has never won in the playoffs. Luka has gone to the Western Conference Finals. Like, I think there. this was part of the Jokic conversation. I don't think it should be. I think it should be contained. But So I'm not even talking about the MVP part of this. I'm talking about you are very skeptical about whether or not Luka plays winning basketball. But he's been to a Conference Finals. So... But you kind of seem to be extending a grace to Shea for having this great regular season, even though he's never come close to winning in the playoffs. So how do you square those two? Well, one, I think regular season winning is different than playoffs, right? It's about like I was very consistent on this last year as you judge the regular season. But I forget like, the MVP part. I just want to talk about if oh, winning basketball. Um, who's, who's yeah, no, he's, he's made a conference finals when Jalen Brunson beat the Jazz and the Suns had COVID. So it didn't count. I'm, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, here's, here's the rest of it. Lost to the Clippers. Well, the Suns badly. Had, the no, Suns, no, no. Lost the Suns might have had COVID. No, no, no. Lost to the Clippers badly. Lost to the Clippers blowing in a 2 0 lead. How often do we forgive guys for that? Uh, made the conference finals behind Jalen Brunson being the Jazz and COVID. Tanked. Had to tank to get the 10th tenth, tenth pick. Had to tank it. Had to openly miss the play. Like, had to be like, no, we can't, we can't try and win. What other player has done well, that? So just are you are you you're out on Luca this year in the playoffs? I like no. this Dallas team. No, because I think they're really good. I think they're really good and they have a legit shot shot of making the, the conference finals. The difference here is not like here's the thing. You're like, you hate Luca. No, no, no. I hate the conversation about Luca. I, like I hate the conversation about a lot of players. Luca is an incredible player across all levels. He is amazing. And with the right team around him, if he gets the right series of matchups, they can make a conference finals. Absolutely. But he's talked about on Jokic's level should Luka be on Jokic's level 
Well, I, I look, I do think there is something to winning it. We watch Yoke go through it, and I think there is something to like you got ultimately you have to get over the hump. Luca's bill is about due. I actually think he probably, in my opinion, Luca probably has this year's grace period. Meaning, I think that we can be a little overly harsh on players early in their career for not getting success because very few players actually find that level of success that early in their career unless they have just a can't miss team. But his the bill is due for him, I do think, this year. I think this is a watershed moment. If you flame out early in the playoffs, if you underperform or if you don't go on a run, I think it is it would be time. But for me, he's done a lot in his short career for me to go, you know what? It's there's signs there that he's actually a a pretty freaking good player. Yeah, he's done a lot um with the ball in his hands 100 percent of the time um, you don't like that style and i don't either I don't, to be honest with you. see that's the thing is that's really the crux of it adam honestly it's it's more of here's what i believe i believe that teams take on the identity of their best player and that the best player often has the most say in how teams play Jokic taught me that you know though but you know something Matt, on this point you could say this about lebron and I think we all say this in hindsight because we weren't thinking that, but there was a little bit of this at LeBron in, in Cleveland where it felt like, yes, he doesn't have the right teammates. Teams yes, this great. or that. But they were their not team- great teams. Those I know, but, but but again, I think there's something too. Luka doesn't necessarily need another great player. He needs the right kind of role players. But there is also this thing about with LeBron where even though he came up short with some good role-playing teammates, he didn't know how to win and he had to go other places to learn how to win. It was like, okay. And Luca might have to do that as well. Yeah. He's all, he's also really young. Like he's still really young. What is he? 25. Yeah. Like he's super young, but I mean, again, 25 is about when the bill, I understand how I come off here and like, I got to adjust it because uh, what's going to happen is he's going to make a run. And then I'm my mentions are going to be a dumpster fire. And I get it. Like, I don't think that Luca is a loser. I think, I think I think you should go all in. The Skip Bayless went all in on anti LeBron. You, I think you should go in on anti Luca. But I don't want to do that. Like that's the thing is like I, I care about the stuff and I want to do it. I want to be intellectually honest with it. But I care very much when guys are given more credit when they haven't done it because I value so much having done it. That's the whole veteran versus young guy argument. It's why I value Justin Holiday because he's stuck around in this league for so long. Right? He played great by the way the other day. Jason Tatum. Yesterday has one playoff series. Jason Tatum showed up to a game seven when they were down three, one and won that game. Like Tatum's made four conference finals, one finals. I do not doubt that Jason Tatum is a winning player. And I actually don't doubt that Luke is a winning player. The dude's hardwired, super competitive. I don't trust his decision-making at times. Um, did you watch, did you, you probably didn't. So I, I watched warriors Mavericks last night and some of the shots that he takes where he's just like, fires up from 30 like and they're weirdly timed where i'm just like is that don't because i i I honestly i'm swear to god yoke has shifted me so much in valuing possessions because he really does seem to value every possession now where it's like he still does crazy passes but it's not like it was when he was younger because he values every possession now and that really changes like the way that i look at things and it's not that I, i i understand how i come across but it has been frustrating to me to see a guy like Shea Gillis Alexander, who has led the youngest team in the league to potentially the one seed, who is the engine of it, who is a phenomenal two-way player, get shoved aside. That's been frustrating for me. I don't think SGA should win. I think Jokic should win. I voted Jokic one in the in the straw poll. But that's been my take on, on SGA. It's like I think SGA should finish two. I think he's yeah. deserved that. Jokic, look, every we shouldn't complain about Jokic because every great player has gone through this voter fatigue. And I honestly think there's a little voter fatigue in in even all of these conversations where we're like, yeah, but he's done a great job. He's done a great job. Like, yeah, but Jokic's also done a great job, and it's clear he's way better. So I think there is a little bit of that going on, but it's inevitable. LeBron went through it. Michael went through it. All the great players have gone through this thing where it's like, to your point, Jokic, it's his third best MVP season. So that feels bad. But it's like, yeah, but Jordan's third best MVP season was – one of the greatest seasons of all time. Yeah. So there's that's like a little I, bit that's of that. That's where I ultimately come down to is when I look at everything and I'm like, man, Joker just hasn't been as good at the rim and like his three points down. Mm-hmm. And like, I actually don't think his defense has been good this year for the most part. And then I look at everything and I'm just like, yeah, no, he controls the game better than everybody else. He's the most impactful player towards winning. He's the MVP. Um, that's how it goes. Thanks you for joining. Wins, so you're calling it a lock. Is he winning for sure? Yeah, he's locked. It's done. It's been done. It was, it was done when SGA started to tail off and when Luka made the run, because he's going to count. They're going to cannibalize votes from each other. Um, it's done. Look at uh, mm, Nikola Jokic is the third exactly. MVP. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you guys being with us here on World's Finest. Uh, swipe is back with you tomorrow, and then swipe and grape on 
Friday morning. And then you can catch us again on World's Finest on Sunday night. We'll talk about the game versus the Atlanta Hawks for the the Denver Nuggets. Uh, we'll talk about the game versus the Clippers on Friday morning with Swipe and Gripe as well. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you guys being with us. Have a great day. We'll see you guys again next time on Locked on Nuggets.